And that's when I started studying hypnosis and I became a hypnotist and started weaving that into my work. And that's when the incredible transformations happened. It was just so much easier, so much faster. And once you start working with the subconscious, you never want to stop doing that because it's a shortcut. It's a hack into getting the outcomes that you want. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. As a top analyst and senior executive on Wall Street, Mary Vesson was burned out and seeking a way out of the drudge. She focused her attention on science-based hypnosis practices, and she soon found that hypnosis was a way to reduce stress and deprogram harmful beliefs. As she began to use her new skill with other C-suite level women, hypno coaching became her new calling in life. And I am excited to have you on the show, Mary. Welcome. Thank you, Sandy. I'm so excited to be here with you. So let's begin with what does woman of value mean to you? To me, a woman is innately valuable. We are born into this body and there will never be another person exactly like us in the history of the universe. And to me, just by nature of the fact that we are here and we are unique and we were placed here or we chose to be here makes us valuable. Now, sometimes we don't see that value and it can take it can take time and sadly some people never see that value i feel like once we know that once we have that inner understanding that we are valuable that we can then inspire others and make more of a difference in the world our inner knowing of our value gives other people permission to show up and be their best too yes absolutely Let's go to your story and how you found your value as as a hypno coach, as an executive coach. You were this person working in in C-suite, top analyst. How did you get to be who you are today? Well, it's, it's quite a journey. I have to say, I grew up in what I would call an unstable household. I never really knew if I was safe on any particular day. And there was a lot of stress around us, a lot of financial stress as well um, as other kinds of stresses. And from a young age, I, I didn't feel like I was a somebody. I felt like I would have to prove that at some point in my life. And I also was always trying to figure out how can I ensure that I have a more stable life, that I have a happier and a, and a successful life. And Around 14, I found a book called How to Buy Stocks by Peter Lynch. And I decided that this is how I'm going to do it. I want to learn to be a smart investor and I'm going to go to Wall Street and I'm going to make a lot of money and I'm going to become somebody and then I will be valuable. And that's what I did. I studied economics and finance in college. I worked at a brokerage firm part-time when I was in college and then I went to New York and I had to go in the back door because I wasn't coming from a, an Ivy league school. And I worked my way up the ranks and I became a research analyst. And then I was building my franchise. And as my paycheck grew and as my titles improved and increased, I, was attaching my value to those things. And I was very proud of those external accomplishments, but inside there was always this this feeling of I'm not enough. And no matter what I do, no matter what I achieve, no matter how much money I made, that was still there. And my responsibilities grew soon I was not soon, but after some time, I was co-head of equity equity research at Deutsche Bank. And we were merging with all these other companies. And it it was really a lot that was happening. And I didn't know anything else. I, I just thought, you know, you just keep doing this because you're good at it. 
And one day everything came to a, a screeching halt. My husband said, I want to have children. And I just, I froze because I had told him from an early age, look, I don't know how to do that. I, I, I don't think I'll be good at it. So I don't want to do it. And he said, okay. And, you know, we were young at the time and I loved this man and I still do. And I wanted to make him happy. And I think I also needed the permission to, to do that, to, to leave what I was doing. There was no way I could continue with those 80 hour weeks and have kids. And that was really challenging for me, Sandy, leaving those external signs of quote unquote success and becoming a mom and then moving into, I, I moved into um, a lot of uh, philanthropic activities and di different charitable things. And I was always learning. I was always studying psychology, human behavior, even from a young age. And then my husband and I in 2010 went to a Tony Robbins event and I saw him take people from suicidal to joyful in 30 minutes. And my entire body lit up and I just knew that this is what I'm here for. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Some story. <laughs> uh, I've actually watched Tony Robbins do that whole thing. I think there was a Netflix special a number of years ago where there was a man yes. from Germany who was suicidal. We were there for that, actually. Were you? Oh, my yes, God. We've been to several of his events. And that yeah, the movie is I'm Not Your Guru. Yes. And we were there live. And actually, we've seen ourselves in the audience. It's so funny. But I, I have to tell you, the transformations were even more powerful in person. Yeah. So you were motivated to become a coach and help people have these kinds of transformations. Yes. And then what happened was, as I was working with people, they were getting a lot of breakthroughs. And most of my clients were doing amazing. But then I noticed there were still these stubborn subconscious patterns where people said, you know, I want this and I'm doing all these things, but it's still not happening. Something is holding me back. Something is having me self-sabotage. And I knew I had to figure out how to help people get out of those patterns that were beneath the conscious mind. And that's when I started studying hypnosis and I became a hypnotist and started weaving that into my work. And that's when the incredible transformations happened. It was just so much easier, so much faster. And once you start working with the subconscious, you never want to stop doing that because it's a shortcut. It's a hack into getting the outcomes that you want. I think so much of what we experience is beneath the surface and so much of therapy and healing is about talking and not somatic healing, not in your body, not underneath the surface and in the unconscious. And so I, I totally support any kind of treatment, um, any kind of healing that takes place on the, in the unconscious because I think we store so much there. Yes. And therapy is very valuable when someone has trouble talking about a problem or getting clear on what they want to shift. And I work with a lot of clients who, who go to therapists and they sort of dig it up and then they come to me and they say, okay, now I, I know what this is. And then, and then I say, okay, great, let's change it. How do you mm -hmm. want it to be? And it, it's fantastic. Having that ability to make those shifts quickly. And what I do is I teach my clients how to do it for themselves so that they have the tools for the rest of their life. It changes your life. It changes what you believe you can do. And it changes how you feel inside as well while you're doing it. So it's, it's a win-win. Yeah. And I would say that from what you've described, a lot of your clients are good at doing, they're not so good at being and de-stressing, right? Yes. So many people have awareness, like that. I would mm -hmm. say a lot of people don't even have that, but that's always the first step. So if someone can help you be aware, that is the first step, but then a lot of people don't know what to do with that information. And that's so you're exactly helping them 
right? To get to that next level. Yeah. A lot of times they just keep regurgitating it or going into, well, why am I like this? Why do I have this? Where did it come from? How long have I had it? And none of that is necessary Mm -hmm. for changing it, for healing it and for getting what you want. And so as much as people can listen to hypnosis on their own and use tools from hypnosis and NLP and and other and other other ways to change behavior i i encourage that very strongly i've also studied nlp and a lot of different modalities cuz i feel like there's just so many ways we can enhance how we work with clients and also how we heal ourselves yes i had somebody recently say to me so you're a coach are you walking your talk and to me I like that question because I think a lot of people don't walk their talk. They might be good at helping others, but are they being self-reflective? Are they always looking for how can I get better? How can I, how can I do even better and see the missing pieces? And it's not easy to do that. And I'm not saying this to shame anybody, but I do think it's a, it's, it's a responsibility to be also self-reflective when you're working with other people. Absolutely. I, cu- I couldn't agree more. I, I am basically addicted to growing and <laughs> I'm always wanting to work with other practitioners and learn more from someone else and dig in even further to myself, because the more I have these deep understandings of how I've gotten tripped up or how I can still get activated, the better I can help my clients. And I share those with my clients every week, almost in my live sessions, I will tell them, you know, I got activated with this this week and here's what I did. And at first they would, they would be surprised. They would say, what you got activated? Well, of course (laughs) we're all human. It doesn't matter how much work you do. You're still human. You still feel those feelings, but how long do you stew in it? What do you do about it? That's what's important. So I'm constantly sharing stuff that I dig up from myself. And I think that that's, that's valuable to others. Yeah. And we were talking before about Tony Robbins. I'm not your guru. A a lot of what I remember from that documentary was him saying, I also go through stuff. I'm not your guru. I'm not perfect. And I, I think that we, we need to not put other people on a pedestal. I think that that makes them really not approachable. And how can we ever get to be like this person if they are flawless if they have no vulnerability in sharing what they go through as well. That's right. And I think inside of everyone, we have these different ego states and that wounded little girl or that hurt little boy is still in there at some place. It's just, are we making that ego state, that part of us, the one in charge? Are they Mm -hmm. the executive at any given moment? But everyone has multiple ego states inside of them and any number of different stimuli outside can activate it. It's just having that awareness. Oh my gosh, who's in charge right now? Wait a minute. I need to put someone else in charge who's a little wiser than this little girl who's right now shutting down. Totally can relate to all of that. (laughs) So take us to the present, Mary, and tell us, first of all, what what you're up to now. And then I would love to hear some specific ways that you work, because I think all of this is sort of um, vague at this point, like how does hypnosis work? If you can give an example of some transformations that have happened, uh, all of that would add some context. Sure. What I'm focused on now is my eight week course, which is a hybrid of online and live. We have weekly group coaching and movement sessions. And in that course, what I do is I help women reignite their energy because it gets depleted as we move through life with traumas, with you know punches that life throws. And sometimes it's just life chipping away 
but we find that we have our energy declining. And then we dissolve those heavy emotional burdens that so many of us carry for far too long because those also drain our energy. We supercharge the confidence. We create the identity that we want and we get access to the subconscious mind so that we're connected to our magic and we can then make the second half of our life even better than the first. That's the goal of the course. And that's what the women are experiencing. And I see women come in from all walks of life. Some are extremely high achievers at the highest level. Others once were achievers, but they've taken a pause maybe to raise their kids and they want to do something more, but they're not sure if they've still got it or they feel tired or something in a relationship might be draining them. And they're not sure if they can can, can get it together to, to do something bold. And it's incredible. Within a couple of weeks, I see major shifts in the women, in the way that they look at the world, in the way that they're feeling in their bodies and in the way that they're thinking. So some of what I teach them is how to pay attention to what you're focusing on and pay attention to the meaning that you're putting to things that happen. These are very basic things, but even the smartest people can not be aware of how they're focusing on the negative things and not the positive. And they're stacking those negative things to feel miserable. And another thing that people tend to do is they tend to focus on what they can't change. And that is a recipe for anxiety. So we, we really focus on becoming aware of your patterns, learning to take a new perspective with things that are troubling you and managing your meanings training your brain. If something is bothering you, if you're fearful about a meeting that you're going to be going into, well, probably you're seeing the image of that person that you're going to meet with big, bright, and close. And most likely you're seeing yourself smaller down below. So we can shift that. We can, we can make them smaller, dimmer, and farther. We can then also create a confidence circuit we can generate confidence by referring back to times when the person felt very confident and we we connect them to those sensations in their body and then we can also basically copy and paste that to the future event in which they want to feel confident so that when they walk in they activate that circuit they have basically experienced it already in their brain. The brain doesn't know the difference between reality and imagination. So they've seen it, they've visualized it, and they have a completely different perspective of, of what they're feeling. Now, some of the women that I've worked with have come from relationships that were unhealthy for 10 years, 12 years, going back and forth to, to something that was really very toxic for them. And then within a couple of weeks, they're, they change, they change they they leave these relationships. They realize that they are valuable and they don't need to be treated like this, but we have to go in and take that virus off of the hard drive of the brain that got installed at a young age. Once we do that, once that's gone, it's easy for them to create a new pattern. And then we work to reinforce that. We use specific audios to reinforce new behavior. So those path, those neural pathways get good traction and then they become the default response. So basically you're rewiring people's brains yes. for success and confidence and removing the barriers that unconsciously are there. I mean, I, I don't think we're even aware that we can remove them, that we, you know, you talked about control, what we can and can't control. I think a lot of people think so many things are out of their control and 
some things are, we can't control how other people respond to us, but we can control how we show up, which can influence how people respond to us. If you have ever played small to make other people feel comfortable, or maybe stayed in a bad relationship or job too long because you didn't think you could do any better, I wrote a book for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. Each of the 30 chapters contains a life lesson, a story, and an exercise to bring you closer to reaching your full potential. Becoming a Woman of Value is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. People aren't aware of how these childhood imprints affect them today. And just last week, I was coaching on my on my live uh, in my live session, and one of the women she was saying, "Gosh, I'm just reacting so aggressively to my children, and I really don't like this." And I said, "Close your eyes." and tell me what the sensations are in your body. She connected to those. And I said, now, when is the earliest you can remember that you felt these same sensations? And she was six years old. And she was basically having people be very disrespectful to her. And this, all those same feelings came back. And so she was responding in the way that she wanted to respond when she was younger. At the time, she didn't say anything. She was so hurt and shocked. But when her kids would say things, which are natural for kids to be saying at that young age, she would basically go into attack mode because that little girl hadn't been healed. So we healed her in five minutes. We sent her the resources that she needed. We reframed it. We integrated her back in and she has not had that since this was a daily occurrence with her children. She hasn't had it since I think it's been two weeks and she keeps texting me. I can't believe it. I can't <laughs> believe it. It's not even bothering me or it's barely bothering me, but I'm able to take a breath and I'm fine. And so it's, it's going back sometimes to the root and just giving the resources what did that child need at that time? Did they need to know that they were safe? Did they need to know that these people are just hurt and it's not about them? Whatever it is, we take care of that. And then that old trigger just dissolves. Wow. It would be wonderful if all parents <laughs> healed that, that part of them yes. that is still activated. Because I remember when I was having, when my kids were young, when I was just at the beginning of having children and parts of me were starting to come out that I didn't think were there. And I remember in particular, there was this feeling of, I wasn't being heard. I wasn't being respected. Mm. And I would get really angry that how dare you not respect me? I'm the mother. And I knew that there was a better way. I, I mean, I knew that deep down and I knew that I, I just would, it was the cycle of that would just get repeated. I would get upset. My kid would totally not do what I wanted them to do. They would get sassier and, and more stubborn and locked down and it wasn't working. So I finally realized, first of all, I have to listen to my kids. Um, it's not <laughs> a power game, right? And and I, I was able to trace back where it all started and how I really wanted to change how I parented from the way I was parented. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't we don't realize that we repeat these patterns. You know, it's it's such an important thing. And I do have a great relationship with all my kids, but this one of my children, the one who really drove me crazy when she was little, she now has three kids of her own. And she's now looking at herself and saying, I tend to be a critical person. And why am I critical? And then she's starting to like connect the dots. Oh. I was really critical of my body. I was critical of other people. I was critical of my siblings. Now I'm taking it out of my children, you know? And it's like, just really recognizing what we do and how we perpetuate patterns and being able to stop them is yes. so powerful. So powerful. That's a, that's a great example that you shared. There are so many examples like this, and this is what perpetuates 
behavior that we then judge ourselves for because we don't want that behavior, but it just seems to be almost automatic. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at some studies with priming where they would show, they would take participants in a study and they would show them basically word games and they would have them find the words and half were finding words that were aggressive and rude and half were finding words that were polite and kind. And then they take the participants when they finish finding those words, they say, okay, you can forget about all that. Then they send them somewhere else and they're, they have to wait. They're waiting for this person who's in a conversation and the people that read that found the rude words tended to interrupt and tended to be rude. And the people that found the polite words tended to wait and to be kind. And that's a five minute exercise that affected someone's response without them even being aware of it. When we are experiencing something again and again and again as a child, that's wired in there pretty intensely but still we can change it. We can loosen it with just conversation and awareness. And then we can rewire it with hypnosis, with NLP and other, and other modalities. And it's pretty incredible how rapid change can happen. You know, I tell people you can get a B phobia with one sting mm -hmm. and you can rewire something the way you want it just as fast. Yeah. It's pretty incredible, you know, and I see it in as a relationship and dating coach, I see it really strongly show up because people will bring their childhood to their relationships. They will bring past relationships that were unhealed to their current relationship and they can be on a date and all of a sudden somebody triggers a memory of something that they felt in their body and they think that this person is that person. And it's like, we don't even, we don't even realize, you know, it's my daughter had dated somebody once who had been cheated on a lot and he didn't like that she had male friends. And so she, that he would get really jealous and she was getting turned off because she didn't cheat on him. She just had male friends. And she basically said to him, I am not the person who cheated on you. And if you continue to accuse me or to, to be jealous of me, you're going to push me away. Mm. And that's often what happens without even that awareness of why you're getting pushed away. You're just turned off. You don't know why, you know? And so bringing these things to light is just so powerful. It really is. I remember the first time I read work by Harville Hendricks and he said, when you get into a relationship, it's your childhood programs getting into a relationship with the other's childhood programs. And I thought, oh my gosh, that mm -hmm. explains a lot. <laughs> yes. And, and then when you further read and understand that we are in our relationships trying to heal wounds from childhood and putting ourselves into similar situations and hoping that the person won't hurt us or will react in a different way. It's really eye opening. And this is what happens with so many people in abusive relationships. They go back to the same kind of a person who tr is treating them badly. And, and it's almost, it's like an unconscious wish that the person will stop and that childhood wound will be healed. The good news is we can heal the childhood wound without someone having to subject themselves to that ever again. Yes. That's where the healing takes place. It's not trying to make somebody into something they are not, but when we have to first have the awareness that we're repeating these patterns over and over, hoping that somehow this person is going to be different than they were I've had a lot of clients who grew up with abandonment, with abuse, with neglect, mm -hmm. and have consistently chosen partners who neglect them, who mm -hmm. cheat on them, who abandon them. Mm -hmm. And until they started working with me, they never understood that it was connected to family. And it's it's just such an interesting thing that 
the word familiar comes from the same root as family. So these people are familiar. We unconsciously want to heal these wounds and we have to heal them within ourselves. And then we don't really want those people anymore. It's like we are actually repelled by the people who we had been attracted to. Yes. And I love that you said the word familiar because the brain seeks what is familiar, even when it's uncomfortable. So the brain is familiar with a certain kind of relating or even a certain boredom, let's say in a job, that's what's familiar. The brain tends to want to guide you to stay with what's familiar because the brain's job isn't to make you happy or fulfilled. The brain's job is to keep you alive. And it's still programmed to believe that anything new like when we were back thousands of years out with the saber tooth tigers, it's still programmed to believe that something new is dangerous. And so we have to listen to that, that inner voice inside that gets scared and just acknowledge it and be grateful for it and say, you know, it's okay. I can, I can move forward with this. It's not actually dangerous. Right. Right. The safety of the familiar is actually destructive in yes. in most cases and it certainly holds us back from achieving all we can mm -hmm. because we're putting ourselves in a vulnerable position and that feels scary to our brains their anxiety starts the sweating starts how can i do this the self doubt creeps in and that's why the work you do is so important so let's talk about the future what is on tap for you what's your dream for the future well, my dream is to help at least 10,000 women design the second half of their lives so that their second half is even better than the first. And I hope to go beyond that, but that's that's the dream right now. Mm, that's a good dream. Uh, all right. Are you ready for the lightning round? I am. Okay. Buckle your seatbelt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I used to think I wasn't blank enough good enough. What was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? The belief that the past defined me. What's the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? To enjoy the journey, to not believe your thoughts, question your thoughts and step out of your comfort zone. That's where you grow. Yep. All the good stuff happens outside the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. People are petrified to go there. What advice would you give to your younger self? I would say to enjoy every day, to look for what's good, to look for what's new and to, to enjoy it instead of wanting to fast forward to an accomplishment. Time flies. They say youth is wasted on the young and that can mm -hmm. be true. We're, we're so focused on getting to something, really enjoying where you are is so important. Yeah. We're in a hurry. I remember one of my kids was always in a hurry. She would always round up to the next year. I'm, I'm 10 when she was like nine and a quarter and it was just like, slow down, enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. What is something that people often get wrong about you? A lot of people think that everything is easy for me because I tend to make it sound that way, or maybe it looks that way because I am truly enjoying my life and focusing on what's good. And it's not that everything is easy, but it is that I enjoy what I'm doing. So I'm working really hard, but it doesn't feel like work. It feels like fun. I totally relate to that. <laughs> It's, it's almost like the time doesn't, doesn't exist in the same way when you love what you do. And I think it's also much less stressful to be your own boss and to just focus on the things that light you up instead of all the meetings and things that, you know, you had to do in, in corporate world. Yes. And finally, Mary, how would you like to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as someone that reminds people that they are valuable. They don't have to do anything to become valuable. And they're not their past. They're not what happened to them. They're not their traumas. They are who they are and they are valuable. And everyone has a magic about them. 
And I want people to, to remember that and to connect to it. I love that. We have similar missions in life and it's, uh, it's such an important thing. Mary, how can people find you? If you can give us one link and the rest of the links will be in the show notes. Sure. Um, my website is maryvasan.com, M-A-R-I-V-A-S-A-N.com. Wonderful. And we'll have your Instagram and LinkedIn. And we can also share your mind gift um, website. Would you like us to share that? And tell us yes. actually a little bit about that. Yes, that would be great. So what happened, Sandy, is that I was watching as I accumulated all these tools over all these years, I was watching the state of mental health in the US decline. And then we had all that social unrest, political unrest, and then the the invasion of Ukraine. And I was just watching all this happen. And I said, I have to do something. And I called a bunch of my colleagues and, and top thought leaders in hypnosis and coaching and trauma release. And I said, hey, will you contribute? I'm going to put together a website of free resources for people that can't have sessions or, or do high-end courses. And virtually everyone said yes. And so I put together this website, which has all kinds of hypnosis. It has tapping. It has um, an entire anti-anxiety course by Melissa Tears. So many resources for anyone, anywhere. And it's mindgift.org. Wonderful. That's such a beautiful thing that you created. A lot of people feel like they want to contribute in some way and you did something really powerful. So that's, that's just lovely. Well, this has just been so great, Mary. I love your mission. I love what you stand for. I love how you've continued to refine who you are so you can help more women in midlife to really have that transformation and really have the the best possible life they can have in the second half of life. Thank you, Sandy. It's been a pleasure. And I feel the same about you. Keep doing what you're doing. It's so important. And, and it's just wonderful how you're elevating people as well. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching and listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Follow the show, share it with friends. It always helps us to grow even bigger. And as always, here's to the value that you have inside. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.